Morning, everyone. Morning. Happy Mother's Day. Somebody said to me, I heard you're preaching. And I said, yeah. And they said, how come? I said, because I'm the oldest mother in the church. <laughs> in fact, you know what? I'm just about the oldest person everywhere I go anymore. <laughs> One more month, and I'm going to be 93 years old. Yeah, it is great. Yeah, it is great. Hallelujah. I'll tell you what, God has been so good to me. Um, I had such a treat the other day. I went, I went pulled into a parking lot, and down um, at the end of the parking lot was this beautiful, um, can, can you, those things are blinding me. Do I need to move or something? I can't. Okay, because I can't even see my words here. Okay, that's better. Um, so at the end of the parking lot was this tree. Uh, it was just a beautiful tree, uh, one of those ones that, uh, like a weeping cherry or something. Anyhow, I got close to it, and I saw there weren't any leaves on it at all. It was just covered with, like, uh, miniature rosebuds, and it was so beautiful. So I got up under the branches close to the trunk, and honestly, I felt like I was in a, a cage of flowers. And there were all these blossoms on the ground. And some of them were falling because there was a slight breeze. And I just thought, how beautiful this is. And you know what? I remembered that as a young girl of 12 years old, I used to do that. There was um, a tree like that. In a, uh, and I, as I came home from school, there was a shortcut in this uh, these people's yard, and I used to go there and get up under the branches and just, I felt like I was in a cage of flowers. And I, and I, and I started thinking about that 12-year-old girl, and I thought, little did she dream that, that there would be a day when she would be almost 93 doing the same thing <laughs> that she did as a 12-year-old and getting still that same thrill just to be in a cage of the beauty that God has created for us. And then I started thinking, and I thought, did that 12-year-old girl ever dream about what a wonderful life she was going to have? How good God has been to me all my life. If I could sing that song, I'll just say the words, all my life he's been so faithful, all my life. He's been so good to me, and just as long as I am able, I'm going to sing of the praises of God. Um, little did I ever dream I was going to have such an awesome husband to share 62 years with. Little did I ever dream that my children were going to turn out so great. I would have slept much better when they were teenagers if God had given me a vision <laughs> of how they were going to be, the wonderful spouses that they have, my grandchildren, my extended family, this church. I love this church. I love the people in this church. Forty-nine years ago, I came into the old church over here, came through those doors, and I said, I'm home. And this church has been like my second home. And I've seen God do so many awesome, wonderful miracles. I love my friends, my extended family. You know, we're like a family here, bound together with the love of Jesus. It's just been an awesome 93 years. God has been so good. God has been so faithful. And I've just, I'm, I've just enjoyed my life, and I'm just thankful for the life that I have. But what I want to share with you today is um, something that helped transform my life, something in scripture that made me the woman that I am today. So I just want to pray. Heavenly Father, 
We just come in the precious, awesome name of Jesus. Thank you for life. Thank you for life abundantly. Thank you, Lord, that you are everything that you say you are. You are that good, good Father. You are loving, full of kindness and tender mercies, forgiving, and I, we just bless you and thank you this day. <clears throat> Lord, I pray you would use me to touch hearts today, Lord God, to transform minds, Lord. Lord, that everyone would come into that relationship with you, the knowledge of you, the knowledge of the love that you have and the plan and the purpose that you have for each one, Lord, each one. Oh, God, I just ask you to use me, Lord. Put me on like a, a glove, Lord, and just let me be the extension of your love this day, touching all those that you love. Mm. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. I love this scripture. This is, I have a lot of favorite scriptures, but this is my fav, one of my favorite, favorite scriptures. And it's the prayer of Jabez. How many of you know what that is? The prayer of Jabez. Ooh, you got a tree in for you. Hallelujah. Um, Romans 12, 2 says that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. And this is one of those scriptures that transform and renewed my thinking, thinking about myself and thinking about my relationship with my Heavenly Father. This is a fascinating portion of scripture, and it leaves us with more unanswerable questions. And I can't wait to get to um, heaven to meet Jabez. Chronicles is probably the least read book of the Bible, and yet it is where I got one of the biggest life blessing, heart changing, mind transforming lessons. Let's see if I can, okay. The book of First Chronicles covers the period of time between Adam and uh, the death of David. And David died 971 years before Jesus was born. And it's a book of begats. It starts with Adam and goes clear. And it's, let's see, it's uh, First Chronicles 4.10. Could you put that up? So the very... The very first, First Chronicles 1, starts with um, Adam begot Seth, Seth begot Enoch, and it goes on and on. Hundreds of names, that's all it is. This one begot this one, all these unanswerable, unrecognizable names. And then it, chapter 2 is the same thing, chapter 3, chapter 4, and then 42 names... <laughs> After chapter 4, we come to this remarkable passage of Scripture. The Lord stops all the begots, and he says, he says, um, chapter nine, uh, verse 9, chapter 4, Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called him Jabez, saying, because I have, because I bore him in pain. <clears throat> and Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, and that you would enlarge my borders, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that it would not bring pain. And then it says, so God granted him what he asked. I think that's awesome. And then it goes on. And then it goes on to say, um, and Chelib, the brother of Shushan, and the mayor who was the father of him, he begot this one and begot that one. But I think we need to really look at this prayer because with all those begots, 
the Lord came to where Jabez was born, and, and he said, and Jabez was more honorable than all. And then he goes on and he says that J Jabez prayed, oh Lord, that you would bless me indeed, that you would enlarge my borders. Oh, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil, that it would not bring grief. Let's see where I am. Chronicles is the, probably, I was reading the Bible th through, you know, every year, and I get to Chronicles, and I just did not like Chronicles because it was just boring. But then, after a couple years, one day I was reading it, and I saw this prayer. And I, and I just thought, we need to really look at this prayer and dissect it. You know, there's several ways of approaching the Bible. I read one time that, you know, you can take it like medicine, you can, and, or you can, t because you know you're supposed to read it, or like shredded wheat, dry but nourishing. But then, then I love Milky Ways. I love to freeze the Milky Way, and, and then I stick it in my mouth. And I don't want anybody talking to me then, because I got a Milky Way in my mouth. <laughs> And, and, it, and I just like let it plaster up against the roof of my mouth. And it takes about 20 minutes, you know, to eat that Milky Way. And that's how we need to approach the Bible. We need to approach it like it's the best thing that could happen to us that day. To just to suck all the goodness out of it and just let it, just let it nourish us and transform us and change us. Even after... I swallow the Milky Way and there's no, nothing left. I can still taste it in my mouth. And that's how we need to approach that Bible. Like it's, like it's just the best food that you ever had because it nourishes your soul. It nourishes your soul. I pray this prayer for myself so many times. Lord, that you would bless me indeed. And I pray it for others very frequently. I'm praying it for Rose right now. I'm praying, oh, Lord, bless Rose indeed. Enlarge her territory. Oh, that your hand would be with her and that you would keep her from evil, that it would not bring grief. The name Jabez means pain. Literally, his mother said, he will bring pain. Imagine Imagine having a name like that all your life. He's going to bring pain. <laughs> Just, we wonder, why did she call him that? You know, this passage of Scripture leaves us with so many questions. Did she have such a painful birth that she was bringing him in, giving him life? Did, was she dying as he was being born? Was Jabez a victim of rape? Was his, did her uh, husband abandon her? Had her husband died? Why would she call a child, he will bring pain? Rick and I had apartments, and I, I'll never forget, this one woman called one time, and I was going to give her an appointment, and I said to her, you know, what is, how do you spell your name? And she spelled her name, and I said, how do you say your name? And she says, I don't want her. I don't want her. And I said, that is really an odd name. She said, what can I say? My mother named me. I don't want her. I don't want her. And I thought of the pain and the rejection. Every time she would say her name, it was proclaiming that her mother did not want her. But I think that's one of the first lessons that we learn from Jabez is that the circumstances you were born into, whether you were wanted or not wanted, what the world says about you does not define who you are. Yes. Jabez prayed this prayer, and God gave him his request. You know, we need to rise above 
God has a plan and a purpose. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plan and the purpose I have for your life. Plan to do you good. Plan with a future and a hope. He has a future and a hope and a plan for each one of you. Each one of you. You're so unique. There never was anyone like you before, and there never, ever will be again. You know, and God's got a plan for you. He's got a purpose for you. For such a time as this, you were born. You were no accident. And it doesn't matter who wanted you, but God wants you right where you are just to love you and bless you and nurture you and bring that life abundantly because that's who he is. That's what he does. <laughs> He's our Abba Father. Mm. Recently, I was praying for what seemed like a mess. <laughs> and I, I just sat there in my chair and I thought, God, how can I pray for this? I don't know how to pray for this. It's a mess. What can I pray that I haven't prayed already? What, can, what words can I use that I haven't already used? And, and I thought, it's just a mess, Lord. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me, <clears throat> I make masterpieces out of messes. That's what he does. He makes masterpieces. You might be in a mess right now, but just trust God. I've been in messes, and, and he has worked all things together for good in my, in my life and in our lives. What can't he do? What can't he redeem? What can't he turn together for good in our lives? The first thing that Jabez asked was, oh God, that you would bless me indeed. That indeed means a whole bunch. <laughs> he said, oh God, that you would bless me a whole bunch. That's a great prayer, isn't it? It's not a selfish prayer. It's a prayer because Jabez had to have a knowledge of the goodness of God. Sometimes we learn our greatest lessons in the messes. Sometimes we learn our greatest lessons in times of trial and times of tribulation. You know, unfortunately, when we're in in the valley, that's when we seek him most. And on the mountaintops, we start to forget the goodness of God in our lives and who put us on that mountaintop. <clears throat> Proverbs um, 10, 22 says, the blessings of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no pain or sorrow with it. In Psalm 103, it states the Lord, um, it states that the Lord showed his ways unto Moses. When Moses asked God in Exodus 33, show me your ways, Moses, show me your glory. He wanted to know the Lord and his ways. He wanted to know who the Lord was and this was the Lord's answer to Moses. The Lord said, I am the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. Jesus said in John 10.10 10, that the thief comes but to kill and to rob and to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that you would have life, and that more abundantly. He's not, this is not just for when you die and go to heaven. God is a God of the living. He wants to bless your life. That's who he is. The second part of Jabez's prayer is, enlarge my territory. Some translations say my borders. I was thinking of this when Rich was up here talking about all the different things that the church is going to be doing in the next couple of months. Enlarge your borders. If you have never signed up for something, do you know when you go to be a blessing, 
You're the one that's blessed. This is an opportunity to have your borders enlarged, your territory enlarged. If you have never signed up for anything like this before, then do it. Just the fellowship of being with brothers and sisters <clears throat> and just the of letting the Lord stretch you. If you're uncomfortable, that's good because then you've got to put your faith and trust in the Lord. I asked Cindy Barterstock if I could share this, but she signed up for the jail. She didn't know whether she could do it or not, and she, she was, but she just felt that she wanted to do it. And then when the first time we went down there, <clears throat> we said to her, what did God give you to share? <clears throat> Excuse me. And Cindy said, oh, I, I don't think I can do that. She said, I've, I've never spoke in front of a group. She says, I don't think I can do that. But you know what? She did. She, en she allowed the Lord to enlarge her territory. And she got up there and gave her testimony. She had those women sitting on the edge of their seat just drinking in everything she had to say. Because of her testimony and because what she had been through, the messes that she had been through, God used her to touch their lives because she was able to say, look what the Lord has done in my life now. She was the one that was blessed. Yes, Cindy? Yes. <laughs> A woman told me recently that she is the woman that she is today because another woman came alongside her, saw a value in her that she did not see in herself, and enlarged her to live outside of the box. Rich talks about that all the time. Live intentionally. Live outside of the box. Cindy stepped outside of the box. She did something that she had never done before, and she was so blessed in doing and strengthened. And now it's like we go from faith to faith and glory to glory. So, so last Saturday she shared again because God, she knew that she could because she put her faith and her trust in God. It's good when you don't think you can do it because then you have to put your faith and trust in the Lord. You're not putting your faith in your own abilities. When that happens, many times it becomes flesh. But when you put your faith in God and allow him to work through you, it becomes an eternal work for his glory and his honor. You know what? If the church had been doing what it was called to do, this world would not be in the mess that is in today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Oh, that your hand would be with me. This is not a prayer of weakness. It is a prayer of power. It is a prayer of presence. It is a prayer of strength. When God's hand is with us, we can declare, like in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. I love, 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 love Psalm 78, 72. He fed them according to the integrity of his heart, and he guided them with the skillfulness of his hands. Whose heart has greater integrity? Whose hands are more skillful? I pray that for myself. Oh, Lord, guide me with the, uh, feed me with the integrity of your heart. Guide me, Lord, with the skillfulness of your hands. Or I pray that for others. It's a great prayer. The hand of the Lord is the term for the presence and power of God in your life. It means that you have God's divine approval and that you, you welcome it and you want to be dependent on him. Before I became born again, I thought that Christians were weak, that they weren't their own woman, that they needed a crutch um, to get them through life. And I thought, I don't need a crutch. You know, 
I'm a woman, I am power, I can do what I can do. And, but that is not a sign of weakness. Depending upon the Lord is a sign of strength because he gives you that strength to live for him and to be a blessing on this earth. Don't you want to be a blessing? Don't you want to touch other lives? Don't you want to see people saved, people healed, people touched, people transformed, captives set free? Then ask the Lord to give you that strength. Ask the Lord to flow through you. That's the only, the gifts are the only things that we're allowed to lust after, that we're to desire with all of our hearts. Ask him to use you. You know, get out of the box. You'll never get back in again. Ezra declared that all his accomplishments were due to the hand of God. Acts 11.21 says, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and great numbers believed and turned to the Lord. The success of the early church was attributed to the hand of the Lord that was with them. We have seen so many miracles and healings in the healing rooms and even down here um, because the hand of God. We, we, if you make a place for him, he comes. And, and, the, and the leadership has made a place for, for the presence of God to come and to touch bodies and to do signs and wonders and miracles. I don't even have time to begin to tell you all the things, but I just want to tell you this one thing because I talked to my brother the other day, and he was telling me about this man that had come to healing rooms. He was, um, he was diagnosed, diagnosed with uh, cancer of the lungs, fourth stage, inoperable, literally sent home to die. He coughed constantly. He couldn't get off the couch. They didn't know whether he was going to make it to healing rooms or not. He came, and uh, everybody prayed for him, and he stopped coughing immediately. This was a Sunday night. By Tuesday, he went to work. He worked construction. So he went from being on the couch to pounding nails <laughs> in two days, and that was four years ago, and he's still totally cancer-free. <laughs> But my brother said, he's a new person. He said, not only was his cancer healed, but his meanness, he was mean. He was abusive. He, was, he never smiled. He didn't want to be touched. You know, don't touch him, don't hug him. He didn't touch anybody else. He says, now, boy, he just grabs your hand and he's hugging you. His, his, whole, his whole life has been changed. Not just his lungs healed. But his whole uh, persona has just been totally changed dramatically because of the hand of God. Mm. Wow. That's what he does. That's who he is. Mm. And when you get out of the box, you get a chance to be a part of what the Lord is doing and what the Lord wants to do through you, to be a blessing to others. Keep me from evil uh, is the next. This is all one sentence, too, which is the amazing thing. Keep me from evil that it would not bring pain. Evil brings pain. And what is evil? Evil is, I read one time that evil is perverted good. And, and I've been thinking about that over the years. I can't think of one thing that is evil that is not perverted good. Even lies. Lies are perverted truth, right? Uh, perverted sex. God created sex, and it to be holy and pure and beautiful and lovely. But when it's, when it's evil, it's, it's perverted. It's not what God has created. It's, 
it's even uh, it's perverted goodness. Evil is perverted goodness. Jabez's prayer, keep me from evil that it would not bring pain. The word evil is in the Bible 592 times. Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the glory and the kingdom and the power forever and ever. Psalms are filled with prayers of petition to be kept from evil. Psalm 91 says, because you have made the Lord, who is your refuge, the most high, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, and no plague shall come nigh your door. John 10.10 10 again, Jesus said, the thief comes but to kill and to rob and to destroy, but I have come that you would have life and that more abundantly. The last part of First Chronicles 4.10, so God granted him what he requested. Wow. God granted him to, to, um, that he would bless him a whole bunch, <laughs> that he would enlarge his borders, that his hand would be upon him, and that he would be kept from evil. That's a great prayer. That's a great prayer, and it's the word of God. Why? Because Jabez prayed what God wants for us what our Abba Daddy wants to do for his children. He's just waiting for someone to say, use me, use me, flow through me. Let me be the extension of your love. Let me a blessing on this earth. Let me touch others for you. Let me see bodies healed. Mm. Let me see captives set free. Let me see people come in to the knowledge of the Lord. That's the greatest miracle of all. That is the greatest miracle of all, to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and to become a new creature. And that's what God wants. I think that's what he wants most and foremost. You know, and that's enlarging, certainly enlarging our territory is to step out. I used to tell people all the time about the goodness of God. God did this for me, and God did that for me, and God. And then I would walk away. And I, I never would say to them, have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? You can do that right now. He's just a prayer away. And then one day I did, and the person said, yes. Do you know what? It was the greatest high I think I have ever had in my life. You could have peeled me off the ceiling because it, there's just no greater joy than to see somebody come into the kingdom of God and, and for them to know that he's just a prayer away. A nurse came to the house to um, help me when I was taking care of my mother, and I told her about the plan of salvation. And she said, I said, would you like to receive Jesus as your Savior? She says, yeah, I would. She says, it's a good deal. It is. It's a great deal. It's the greatest deal you ever get in your whole life. Yes, amen. So step out of the box. You know, ask someone, have you ever received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but would have eternal life. God so loved the world, this, this crazy world, this sinful world. God so loved the world. In Romans 3.23 it says, all have sinned. All come short of the glory of God. Is that everybody? Yeah. You mean Billy Graham? All have sinned. You know what? If we could work our way into heaven by our own goodness and by our own worth, then Jesus would not have had to come and die on the cross. 
One time, one time, you know, when God speaks to your heart, it just changes your heart and transforms your heart. One time I was praying in tongues, worshiping the Lord, and this is the only time this ever happened to me when I got interpretation to my own tongues. And it was, and it was for me, but it's for you because the gifts and calling are for the body of Christ. He's no respecter of person. What he says to one is for the body of Christ. And he said to me, in the name of Jesus, you are redeemed. In the name of Jesus, you are cleansed. In the name of Jesus, you are worthy. Mm. In the name of Jesus. Oh. In the name of Jesus, you claim the promises. And in the name of Jesus, you are loved. So no matter how unworthy you feel, no matter how far you feel from God, in the name of Jesus, you are worthy. <clears throat> Romans um, 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And Romans and um, Revelations 3.21 says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice, and opens the door, I will come in, and I will have fellowship with him. He's just a prayer away. I don't know if all of you were saved or not. But if you aren't, let today be your day. If you don't have that assurance that Jesus is living in your heart, that he has come to bless your life, and that you're going you're to have eternal life, after you pass from this life, then raise your hand. Raise your hand, and we'll just pray with you. Oh, praise God. You're all saved. You're all going to heaven. Oh, isn't that awesome? Yes. You all have a chance to live for him. You all have a chance to have him to have him bless you a whole bunch, enlarge your borders, oh, that his hand would be with you, and that he will keep you from evil all the days of your life. God bless you. I love all of you. Mm. <laughs>